So many of you have probably had a visit from myself or Sally or Karen um, in the last few years, but if you haven't, then I'm going to tell you a bit about what those visits are and what we've found from them. So essentially that Hand Hygiene Australia come out and do some review visits for programs around the country. This was initiated by our advisory committee in 2014 with the objective to evaluate the alignment of the programs with the National Hand Hygiene Initiative and providing some facility to, to those hand hygiene results. And we want to have the other, the other factor that we want to do when we come and do the visits is to identify some innovations. If people are doing great things out there but we don't know about it, how can we tell you all how you should be improving your programs? So the structure is to do an interview and to do some side-by-side -side auditing at the site. And then we provide a report with some commendations and recommendations to that program. So in 2014, the year that we started this and piloted it, we targeted high-performing sites. So we went and visited 22 sites that were high-performing. Their high hygiene appliance rates were high to begin with. And the successful programs had point of care product availability, included hand hygiene in all their educational activities, audited in all areas of their health service, had visible, visible auditors promoting the program regularly, timely performance feedback, the wards were responsible for their own results and did something about it if there was something wrong. They had innovative interventions and promotions, they had active support from their hospital leadership and they had lots of rewards for outstanding performance, not just at an organisation level, but down at a ward level. So the objective of this talk really is to show you how the hand hygiene program is being run now that we're reviewing across a wider type of organisation. We're not just trying to go to our top performing sites anymore, we're branching out to many sites and seeing what's happening out there. And I also want to touch on some future directions for programs. So from 2015 onwards, we've now visited 138 sites around the country. We've been to every state and visited both public and private sites. You will notice a large number for Victoria, and there was a concurrent project being run about um, doing review visits for every public site in Victoria. So where are the hand hygiene leads from? Essentially infection control. A few from quality and a few from other a combination of units, both quality and infection control, sharing it, or perhaps there was a private um, consultant who owned the hand hygiene program. So remembering what our key aim is, that the National Hand Hygiene Initiative is to develop a national hand hygiene culture change program. We've already had talk from um, all speakers so far that hand hygiene is not just about auditing. As much as that's the results you submit to us, we're about changing behaviour. Okay. As Benedetta presented the WHO multimodal strategy for changing behaviour with the five steps. Now, as much as these wordy ones are what I put on my slide, I much preferred what Benedetta showed earlier with build it, teach it, measure it, sell it, and then live it. That's how we want to do it. Build our programs, teach people how to do it, measure it to make sure they're doing what we've taught them, sell it to everyone else who hasn't quite caught on to the idea yet, and then live it, everyone doing it all the time. So what are sites doing around the country? 99.3% are using an EN1500 approved and TGA approved product. If you can do your maths right, there's about one site that's not using a, a proper product. The types of products are being used, and you'll notice they don't add up to 100% because some sites use more than one product hospital-wide, but majority using a solution followed by a gel and then a foam. The product is available at the point of care in 83% of sites. So if they're not having it at point of care, why not? In the 24 sites that didn't have it at point of care, some of it was because there were some special, special wards that didn't have it. Peds, maternity, aged care or mental health rooms. Now in some circumstances, maybe that's not appropriate for particular patients. <laughs> But certainly not a blanket rule should be applied to all of these sites. They should have product availability at point of care so people can actually use products. The other reason for not having it was that it was actually in the room, but if you close the curtains, it was no longer in there. Okay, so looking at where your product is actually situated is really important. Another four sites um, didn't have it at the point of care because of aesthetics or restrictions on the placement because it didn't look right. 
Okay, something we need to change the mindset of the executive team. For two of the sites, uh, it was brackets, and they couldn't get the brackets to fit the beds properly, therefore they couldn't get it in there. Um, my husband's an electrician, so can I just say cable ties <laughs> fix everything. <laughs> okay. um, two sites had recently refurbished, and as much as the patients had gone back in the rooms, not everything else had. So would you put your patient back in the room if the oxygen wasn't working? No, because it's a safety issue. But would you put them back in the room if they didn't have product available to clean your hands? Apparently you will. Okay, and then two sites had other reasons for not having it in there. So education and training. Is hand hygiene education provided on the sites we visited? I'm happy to say that on 100% of sites, yes. Um, for 99% of those, it is a mandatory requirement as well. And for 82% of sites we visited, it's mandatory for all staff, no matter who you are. How is that education being provided? Majority of the time it's through e-learning. And of that, most sites are doing it on commencement of employment that you must do some e-learning, but also annually. So it's being built in like the bullying and like the fire training and all those other things you need to do every year. Hand hygiene is one of those mandatory requirements that you need to do every year. Other sites also do um, formal presentations, technique education, interactive workshops, and simulated clinical scenarios. As of June this year, just to show you what we're doing back at Hand Hygiene Australia, we've had 1.99 million completions of the Hand Hygiene online learning modules. <laughs> Big party. I think we missed the 200, the two million person to give them an award, but they're out there. <laughs> well, okay. Um, there's also been 53,000 completions of the infection control orientation module that was only put on our website in June last year. So, um, quite a number of people learning about infection control in general as well. We've had 3,800 3, gold standard auditors trained and 8,400 auditors trained around the country. So, looking at mo monitoring and performance feedback. Okay, looking at how well people are doing what we're asking them to. I'm going to break it into auditors, audit processes and feedback. So our revisit data indicates that on, on average, at each site we've visited, there are around six gold standard auditors. Or if you look at who's actually active and collecting data, it's probably closer to four. There's an average of 24 auditors per site, with the active rate being only about 13. <laughs> There's around an average of 10 OLP completions per site, 13 auditors with 100 moments. So only roughly 33 to 59% of auditors are actually validated. When we've done some re review visits, we do the side-by-side -side auditing to just check correlation. I'm happy to say that 92% of those we did the side-by-side -side session with had a close correlation with the reviewer and all only minor discrepancies. And the main discrepancy around auditing was around curtains. Whether you're including them as a moment or not, and they're not a moment, but they are dirty. Um, of the sites where there was a major discrepancy between the reviewer and the auditor on site, 77% of those programs had no auditor refresher program, no regular update for those auditors, which may lead to why there's some discrepancies over time. Of the auditors on site, 50% of sites we visited do train general auditors, mostly using a one-day program, some with a multi-day program and others in various other ways. The auditors are mostly nurses. There's very few educators and there's very few from other professions. Some interview comments around auditors have been there's lots of auditors trained, but not many actually auditing. Auditors are not released from their other duties. The refresher sessions may have been offered, but no one actually wants to come. Or the auditors feel lost. In audit processes, 67% of the auditors audit their own wards, where the sites were visited, and 60% of auditors do not have dedicated auditing time. 40% of the sites we visited do all wards every audit, and 34% do not include all their acute areas. 
51% conduct local audits, and some of the reasons for conducting local audits instead of sending the data into the national report <coughs> is that 38% want to include wards that were not in the national audit. 31% um, wanted to include non-acute wards, or 20% to focus on performance improvement. Now, to, to put some context to this slide, Hand Hygiene Australia made the local audit process primarily for those wanting to focus on, on performance improvement. You find a ward that's got low compliance, you go in and do some um, extra auditing to address that problem. And you might not want to put that as part of the national audit, and that's why we created it. Not necessarily to segregate where your data sits so that your rate looks good. So some areas that are not audited in the sites we reviewed, 57% of sites do not audit radiology. 26% of sites do not audit their periop areas, so example, recovery. 17% of sites do not audit their emergency department. And 12% of sites do not audit their oncology department. So we've touched on it and we'll, each speaker here will touch on it further, but we have updated our audit process and, and our selection of departments for auditing. So if you go to the National Data tab under the guidelines for data submission for hospitals, you will find it. And it does now say that we want to audit all el eligible departments, which do include emergency okay, and do include radiology as an optional department to audit. So performance feedback, are we telling everyone what's happening out there? Yes, 88% 80, of people are providing immediate feedback and Narelle is going to talk to us later in the program about providing that immediate feedback during auditing. 35% do provide feedback at the end of the session and 41% publish interim reports. 20% do not perform any data validation checks of their data though before they submit it to us. And 72% do not run an auditor and sessions report, which I'll talk to you about later in the day. 91% do have a higher local target than the national benchmark, but this was including um, visits prior to the increase of that, 81, of that 80%. However, most sites do report their results to their executive team, their infection control committees, and their quality committees. So that's great. As for reminders in the workplace and selling your message, um, some site-specific um, posters are generally the way that people are trying to sell the message. So having medical staff on posters promoting the use of the hand hygiene products um, set, tends to work in those departments to improve compliance. Having specific ward staff photos for that particular ward on posters is helpful. Or a lead the way type approach where you've got specific professional groups on posters around those departments to try and spread the, spread the message. Other things that people are doing um, for reminders or, or awards in their sites are trophies for top performing wards, uh, having photos in newsletters or any um, media briefs that the hospital does. And rewards are always great and do um, spread the cheer, if not the improved compliance, but having lollies, coffee vouchers and, and any type of food, health workers love food, but rewards were certainly um, being used quite regularly in a lot of programs. As for that fifth idea of changing culture, um, safety scrums and handover conversations were including hand hygiene in a lot of sites we visited. So having every time you do a handover for a patient, including hand, a, a, a comment about hand hygiene or a reminder about hand hygiene for that shift is being used in a number of sites. And then consumers are being used in a lot of sites as well. In It's an okay to ask program. Okay, we do find that many people say the value from having consumers and giving the right to consumers the right to say, have you washed your hands or have you cleaned your hands, is in that the health care worker knows that they have to provide that information to the patient and therefore they're trying to learn a bit more because they're expecting the patient to ask. The patient may not actually ask though. Other sites are using surveys of patients, either on discharge or post discharge and finding out, um, doing a, a conversation with the patients, did you see anyone do hand hygiene? Many sites are publicly displaying their hand hygiene results. A lot of sites are giving hand hygiene brochures in um, the packs to all patients in every, in every area. 
some sites are also going to the extent of providing personal hand hygiene products for the patients to use at meal times and at other times as well. To not just talk about hand hygiene in the clinical sense of a healthcare worker, but also to provide the patient to be able to do hand hygiene if they're um, bed bound. The biggest barriers that people talked about when we were doing the review visits, medical staff, <coughs> it's always going to be there. We will, we will get there eventually. Um, Time to educate and attend education was another big barrier, and disinterest was a common theme. The most effective components of the program, as reported in the site visits, was having alcohol rub at the point of care, was having executive involvement, was having local ownership and champions, was having education regularly, and was having auditing and feedback of those results. Not just collecting data and putting it aside, but feeding it back, not just to the high levels, but down to the ward levels as well. So where should we go with this data of, of what's happening out there? For system change, okay? For building the, the program, you need to ensure there's product available, and we would hope that we could aim for 100% product availability in every patient area. And if you can't place the product there yourself, then at least have the healthcare workers access to the product, whether that be a pocket pack or something, so that every healthcare worker can have access to a product no matter where they are with the patient. For education and training, do we need to educate on technique? That's a good question, and certainly from Benedetta and the evidence presented, perhaps we do <coughs> need to talk more about technique. Do we need to move more towards scenario training rather than online when they might just click all the buttons and not actually read the information? We certainly do need to ensure that the healthcare workers understand the patient impact. <coughs> Maybe we need to create some more Australian videos of the patient impact story. We've all seen Glenn's story lots of times now. Maybe it's time for a new one. Um, certainly for Hand Hygiene Australia, we tend to be using one called Partnering to Heal for education these days. So if you haven't seen it, Google it, you'll find it. Um, it's an American program, but certainly Partnering to Heal shows a great patient impact um, story or potential, potential story of what could happen. One site specific example though of education and training that I've been to recently was that they present their infection data first, then they present a case study about one of those infections and the impact it had on the patient, and then they present their hand hygiene data. Okay, so rather than going and saying, I'm doing a hand hygiene education day, maybe going out and saying, I've got some case studies, come along and you build hand hygiene into that. For monitoring performance feedback for auditors, I suggest that you do choose your auditors wisely. If they're not going to be able to be released for, from their duties, normal duties, to be able to audit, then are you going to get your most bang for your buck out of training them up to be an auditor? We certainly need to improve our auditor validation pathways and making sure that all auditors are valid. I'll talk about that later. And to ensure that it's a team approach to auditing. Okay, it's not just individual auditors out in individual wards, but it's a team approach. You're all there together to improve hand hygiene. And I think we need to start thinking about involving other professional groups as well, not just nurses. It's a problem of all professions. For audit processes, I think we need to ensure that auditors have dedicated time to audit. It's not just during their clinical shift. We need to improve the immediate feedback and education during audits. We need to ensure all departments of the health facility are included at least once a year as per the new guidelines from Hand Hygiene Australia. And we need to perform data validation checks and check the data before you're happy to submit it to us. Hand Hygiene Australia are designing a new website. We hope to have, I'll say early in the new year, but it might end up being a bit longer. We are dealing with IT, so it takes a bit of time. Um, and we certainly hope to have some pages on our website where we can share things that you've created around the country because it is hard to create new resources. So trying to share some of those is going to be really important. But for institutional climate change, that fifth part of improving culture change, hand hygiene is about patient safety. Okay, and as much as these, every, every, it's great to see that everyone is reiterating this in all our talks, and we actually wrote all our talks quite independently and didn't share them prior, so it's very interesting to see that everyone's saying the same message. But hand hygiene is about patient safety, not just quality. We want to improve patient safety. Okay, thank you.